Um, my name is Yvonne Lam, and I'll be presenting on receptive language skills and addressing faulty stimulus control. Um, I'd like to first thank Dr. Jessica Weber and ELS for Autism Foundation, the ELS Center of Excellence, for this opportunity to contribute to their 18 learning uh, webinar library. Um, so uh, my role here at PALS Autism Society is as the interim head of school, and I'm also a behavior analyst at PALS Autism Society's school program. And we're actually just located in Vancouver, BC, Canada. Uh, before we get started, I'd like to share some information about our school. PALS is actually the first school of its kind in British Columbia. We're a specialized, nonprofit, independent school that provides a safe environment for children and adolescents with autism to gain self-worth, progress academically, socialize, and participate in extracurricular activities and learn life skills. PALS capitalizes on each child's strengths and unique qualities while targeting his or her weaknesses using a scientifically proven teaching method called applied behavior analysis. So we employ highly skilled and enthusiastic teachers and specialized behavioral consultants who follow a modified BC curriculum wherever possible. Uh, we also contract out to specialists um, specialized in speech and language pathology, occupational therapy, music therapy, and art therapy. Uh, we're also a designated uh, special education school by the Ministry of Education as we employ a high ratio of staff to students. Our students are matched with students of similar abilities um, and similar skill sets to create an enriched environment that promotes skill development and communication and socialization. We're currently in the 10th year of operation and we have 18 students ranging in the ages of 5 to 19. And one of PAL's goals is to make the school accessible to all families whenever possible, regardless of income. We currently have seven of our students that are able to attend on bursary assistance that's been provided from uh, organizations, foundations, and individuals. So we would like to increase our student base and accommodate more students from our growing wait list. Our students currently commute to school each day from all parts of the Lower Mainland from upwards of one hour each way. Six years ago, PALS opened an adult program to continue the learning process for young adults and autism for the ages of 19 to 30. The adult program offers an employment readiness training, job coaching, adaptive daily living skills, uh, functional academic supports, volunteer opportunities, and social and recreational leisure activities. It's actually the only program in BC that offers young adults speech and language programming targeting social skills um, provided by a speech and language pathologist. We provide uh, many services to individuals that can physically attend the program center, um, and we also operate year-round to ensure the continuity and consistency of our students' progress. As the cost of our specialized intensive programs are very high, it is really through the generosity of foundations and individuals that help maintain our goal of affordable tuition for all families. Okay, so let's see. So there's a couple of disclosures that I want to um, get out of the way first. Um, on behalf of PALS Autism Society and our students, families, and staff, I'd like to thank ELS for Autism Canada for providing PALS Autism Society with the critical funding, which enables our students to attend um, the before and after school care program. This support alleviates the financial stress for our families um, to ensure that they find appropriate and affordable out of school care. The PALS Before and After School Care Program provides a safe environment for children and adolescents with autism to socialize, participate in extracurricular activities, and to learn independent life skills while making it possible for the parents to continue working to support their families. Also, please note that contents of this presentation have been adapted from LAM's master's thesis. And finally, I'd like to ask you that if you do have any questions throughout the presentation, um, to just write them down, and then there will be some time at the end for questions. Okay, so I'll just begin with a brief overview of the presentation. I'm going to be describing um, discrete child training, uh, which is commonly used to teach receptive language skills. This will lead into a discussion about faulty stimulus control, and we'll go over a different common error patterns as well as review some antecedent-based strategies and consequent-based strategies. 
Okay, so discrete trial training is also known as discrete trial instruction, or it may also be known as discrete trial teaching. Um, it can be used to teach a variety of skills, such as imitation, receptive language, uh, expressive language, and even behavioral skills. Discrete trial teaching is a teaching strategy based on the principles of behavior analysis. For example, there's stimulus control, motivation, uh, reinforcement, punishment, and extinction. Discrete trial teaching involves breaking skills down into smaller steps and then teaching those steps until mastery. Okay, there's typically five components. You have your SD, the discriminative stimulus. Um, this is the instructional cue or stimulus that signals the availability of a reinforcer. You have a prompt, which is a hint or a cue uh, that evokes correct responding. This typically occurs simultaneously with the SD or immediately afterwards. A response, so either a correct response or an incorrect response, which may be followed by some kind of consequence, so either um, a, a reinforcer or some kind of response prompting or an error correction procedure. And then there's your intertrial interval, which is a brief pause in between the trials. Okay, so when we're talking about receptive language, um, it's quite common for many young children diagnosed with autism to have delays in this area, and that's one of the reasons why many of the programs in early intervention and intensive behavioral intervention programs for young children focus on the development of this skill. So what is receptive language? Well, it involves a learner responding to the vocal verbal behavior of others. Um, so deficits in the skill could actually result in challenges in a variety of other skill areas, um, such as in academics like reading, writing, or math, or even social skills, um, such as following simple instructions or being able to respond to one's own name. And later, if there's deficits in these simple skills, there might be actually more complications when trying to teach more complex instructions, uh, such as following multiple step instructions. Okay, so there's a couple different assessment um, tools that can be used to look at where the deficits are for receptive language. Uh, you have your assessment of basic language and learning skills revised, um, also known as the ABLES revised. Um, this, this tool is actually great because it provides um, the different skill areas, such as receptive language skills um, that typical children would acquire before entering kindergarten. The other assessment tool here is the Verbal Behavior Milestones Assessment and Placement Program, um, also known as the VBMAP. Um, they actually refer to receptive language as listener responding, and this assessment tool breaks down the skill sets across three different developmental areas, from 0 to 18 months, 18 to 30 months, and then 30 to 48 months which may be beneficial for practitioners to identify goals and priority for teaching. When we're looking at receptive language, there's two different categories. You have your simple conditional, um, simple discriminations as well as conditional discriminations. Okay, in um, a simple discrimination, there are three components, whereas uh, later we'll talk about the conditional discriminations, which have four components. So you have an antecedent, so this is your SD, so it could be some kind of auditory instruction, um, followed by a response, again, either a correct response or incorrect response, and then the consequence, either a reinforcer or some type of feedback. So one example of a simple discrimination listed here on the screen um, is a child, if they're approaching an adult after hearing his or her name, uh, which is the SD, that might be met with some kind of reinforcement for doing so. However, in the absence of hearing their name, the S delta, when a child approaches the adult, that might actually be met with um, extinction, so they're no longer receiving um, that reinforcement. Um, another really common example is um, when the telephone rings. So th when the telephone rings, the SD um, saying hello afterwards might be met with someone um, on the other end speaking into the telephone, but the S delta, when the telephone doesn't ring, um, saying hello um, instead you might not have anyone speaking back to you on the other end. Okay, so there are um, a few examples of programs that are based on simple discriminations, um, such as having a, teaching a learner to respond to their own name, 
um, following simple instructions such as clap hands or stomp feet, or even following instructions to touch their own body part. This is different than a conditional discrimination, um, which has four components. Um, you would have um, a sample stimulus. This can either be a visual or an auditory instruction. And it's conditional because the sample stimulus would establish one of the comparison stimuli as the SD. So you might have um, either pictures or objects for your comparison stimuli. Uh, the third component is the response, so either selecting um, the picture or object, and then the consequence, so receiving a reinforcer or feedback for an incorrect response. There are two kinds of conditional discriminations. You have visual-visual conditional discriminations. Uh, this would involve matching. And then you have your auditory visual conditional discriminations, where a learner might be presented with an auditory sample stimulus. Um, so on the screen here, the example is spoon. In the presence of the comparison stimuli, the pictures of a cap, spoon, and ball. So hearing the auditory instruction spoon, establishes that picture of a spoon as the SD. Um, so selecting the picture of the spoon would result in a reinforcer, whereas selecting the pictures of the cap and ball would not. Um, that might result in some kind of response prompting or an error correction procedure. So some examples of programs that are based on conditional discriminations are teaching a learner to identify items, pictures, or people from an array. You might also have um, a program where the learner is selecting items when giving its feature, function, or class, or even selecting pictures representing different emotions or actions. So just to recap, a correct response in an auditory visual conditional discrimination would require the learner to attend to both the auditory sample stimulus and discriminate reliably amongst the comparison stimuli, which may be objects or pictures. Um, when you get that reliable differential responding, that's when appropriate stimulus control has been established. Okay. Um, so again, stimulus control occurs when there's differential responding that's been established. So the SD is reliably evoking that responding as the learner is attending to the relevant stimuli. And on the flip side of that, faulty stimulus control, uh, which is quite common among individuals with autism spectrum disorders, is when incorrect responding results in attending to an irrelevant aspect of the instructional environment. Okay, so um, next I'm just going to go over a few of the different common error patterns. So there are uh, stimulus overselectivity, Wednesday responses, uh, position bias, and stimulus bias. So I'll just go over an example of what each one looks like next. Okay, so when we have stimulus overselectivity, that happens when a learner is only attending to either one feature or aspect of the stimulus while ignoring other features. Uh, this might be observed when you're doing some sight word instruction. So a learner might easily be able to discriminate between the words cat, big, and mom, um, but you might only see that there's some uh, stimulus over selectivity when you're presenting the word cat alongside the words cab and cop, and that might be because uh, they're only attending to the first letter of each word. Okay. During a Wednesday response, this is when a learner is attending to um, or only selecting the stimulus that was functioning as the SD in the preceding trial, so regardless of what sample of stimulus might have been presented during the current trial. So in the top row here, the auditory instruction is CAP. If the learner happens to select CAP, uh, they might be met with some kind of reinforcer. In the second trial, the instruction is BALL. The learner continues to select the picture of the cap uh, because this functioned as the SD in that first trial. So during that second trial, after the learner selects the picture of uh, the cap, they might be um, given some kind of error correction procedure. And then in the third trial, when the instruction is spoon, the learner will then select the picture of ball because 
that's what was the SD in the previous trial. So this type of error kind of gives you a clue that the learner isn't necessarily attending to that auditory sample stimulus, um, but rather they do have some scanning abilities and they're able to discriminate between the visual stimuli. Another common error pattern that happens is a position bias. Um, this happens when a learner reliably selects a stimulus in a particular position. Um, so on the screen here, this is an example of a learner selecting the stimulus that's always presented on the left hand side. Um, you might have learners that might always select an item on the right hand side or even the center. And so that lets you know that they might not be attending to the auditory instruction or and they might not actually be attending to any of the visual stimuli. Okay, and then the last one here is uh, a stimulus bias. Uh, this happens when the learner reliably selects the stimulus regardless of which sample stimulus is presented. So again, the learner here isn't necessarily uh, attending to the auditory sample stimulus. However, there is some reliability in um, their visual performance skills. They're consistently looking for the picture of the ball in this example here. Okay, so when we get these common error patterns, um, it can be a concern for practitioners because once that faulty stimulus control has been established, it is difficult to correct the errors to establish appropriate stimulus control. Thus, it's important to begin training with a procedure that reduces the likelihood of errors and the establishment of faulty stimulus control. Okay, so how are we going to do this? Okay, so um, you have to take some data. Um, just as you wouldn't develop a behavior plan without having identified the function of a behavior, um, you wouldn't try to troubleshoot without knowing what kind of error pattern is happening. Okay, so um, the figure on this slide here is an example of a data sheet uh, from Groen LeBlanc's paper, uh, Teaching Receptive Language Skills. Uh, this data sheet is particularly helpful for practitioners because not only does it um, predetermine the counterbalancing of both auditory and the visual stimuli, but it also allows for the tracking of responses to determine whether or not an error pattern is happening. Okay, so looking at this data sheet here, this is an example where the task is selecting pictures of representing actions. So there's a total of nine trials um, across three different targets, and the correct target as well as um, the stimulus that's functioning as the SD is bolded in each trial. Um, so it's predetermined because it allows for the therapist to know ahead of time um, what the auditory sample stimulus is for each trial um, and the SD. And also the therapist knows ahead of time the arrangement of the visual stimuli that will be presented. Uh, next, the therapist would be responsible for circling the correct response from each trial. Um, and also, uh, this is just one example of a session type. There should usually be at least uh, three variations, which allows for the counterbalancing across multiple sessions. So for example, in this session type, the first trial, the correct stimulus would be bathing. So you want to always have that switch up. So across each session, bathing um, isn't always presented as the first uh, trial. Okay, so over the next few slides, I'm going to point out um, some different examples of what the data sheet might look like given each error pattern. Okay, so here we have the Wednesday response. Um, in this example here, the learner is reliably selecting the stimulus that functioned as the SD in the previous trial. So um, typically, if you have uh, three different targets that you're teaching simultaneously across nine trials, um, you would expect just by chance responding, so in an array of three, you would have 33% uh, uh, chance responding. Uh, but take a closer look here, we only see correct responding uh, once out of the nine trials, which is 11%. Um, so this, when you're taking your data, um, looking at the percentages of correct response during baseline might actually kind of give you a clue to see if there's any red flags um, to see if any error patterns in responding are occurring. 
Okay, so next we're going to look at a data sheet for stimulus bias that's happening. Um, so in this case here, the learner is repeatedly selecting the bathing uh, visual stimulus across all nine trials. Uh, so again, based on chance responding alone, uh, you might expect 33% correct responding uh, for the target bathing. However, uh, if you look at the targets for dancing and coloring, um, it's actually occurring at 0%. So again, as a practitioner, looking at these percentages will kind of alert you to these red flags. Okay, so here we have a position bias. So at first glance, if you take a close look here, we can see each um, action is selected once across all nine trials, which results in 33% uh, chance responding across for each target. However, if you didn't have this kind of uh, data sheet that you were using during baseline, um, a therapist might not have actually picked up on this position bias. Okay, so now that we've actually gone through all of these different error patterns, let's look at a few things that we can do from the outset of instruction um, to either remediate this error correction or um, to reduce the potential of having these errors establishing. Okay. Um, when you're teaching the conditional discrimination, there's uh, two methods of teaching. There's uh, a simple conditional method as well as the conditional only method. So as a practitioner, consider which method of instruction you would use. Um, there have been a few studies now that have compared the two. Um, so this table here depicts um, the nine steps that are used in the conditional, the simple conditional method. So the simple conditional method is a sequential approach to teaching three different actions. So here we have, uh, let's see, catching, kicking, and walking. So you can see in steps one, two, and six, the targets are taught in isolation. So the learner isn't necessarily required to attend to the auditory instruction or the visual stimulus. Um, whereas for the remaining steps, except for step nine, um, the targets are taught in a field of two. And finally in step nine, this is where um, all three of the comparison stimuli are presented together. And step nine is what is identical to what you would see in the conditional only method, where all three stimuli are trained together. So in the three comparison studies that have looked at this, they found that the participants learned more rapidly with the conditional only method. Um, so Grow and colleagues in 2011 noted that it may be beneficial to use the conditional only method compared to the simple condition because it might actually the simple, um, the simple conditional might actually foster uh, faulty stimulus control. Let's see. So again, in steps one, two, and six, because uh, there was only one um, stimulus and one comparison stimuli presented at a time, um, the learner was not likely to attend to the auditory instruction or that visual um, or the visual stimuli. And also, um, given that most of the steps in the simple conditional method consisted of an array of two visual stimuli, the learner might actually come into contact with a denser schedule of reinforcement. So because it's a field of two, you only have that 50-50 chance responding. So um, here, it's important to increase your array so it reduces that likelihood of a position bias or a stimulus bias uh, becoming established. Also, the conditional only method um, promotes appropriate stimulus control as the learner is, a, as the learner is required to attend to um, both that auditory sample stimulus and they have to differentially respond um, across the comparison stimuli. And lastly, the conditional only method has uh, less steps, so that might be one of the reasons why it's more efficient. Um, so just to recap, for all three comparison studies, the participants learned more quickly with the conditional only method. A couple other notes to keep in mind during um, the outset of instruction here um, is to deliver simple, clear, and concise instructions. So um, it might not actually be necessary to have extra vocabulary in your instructions, such as touch, show me, or point to, um, for example, if presenting um, the instruction, if you wanted the learner to identify the picture of a cat, 
uh, just say the word cap on its own rather than um, adding in touch show me in point. Um, I've actually seen an error in the past where um, a learner was only attending to the instruction touch instead of the whole instruction touch cap. Uh, so for this reason, it's actually important to uh, have multiple targets running at a time or, or being taught simultane simultaneously. Um, another thing to keep in mind is the size and the display of your array. So again, with a size of with a field of two, you get you might actually foster um, some stimulus bias or um, uh, position bias. Whereas if you increase that to a field of four, you reduce that chance responding to 25% because they only have a one out of four chance of selecting the correct stimulus. Also consider presenting your materials um, or varying the presentation of your materials. So if you're used to presenting them in a linear manner, um, consider presenting them in a scattered array or more like in a semicircle. Also avoid inadvertent prompts. So this is more for the therapist behavior. Um, some learners might actually pick up on the different voice pitches of the therapist. So if a therapist uh, has a lower pitch tone for certain instructions compared to other instructions, then the learner might be attending to that instead of the actual auditory instruction and the visual stimuli. Um, you, might also, you might also want to look for um, the therapist giving um, inadvertently prompting the student by their eye gaze. So ensure that the therapist remains neutral and looks straight ahead during that um, instructional delivery. I've also seen um, uh, newer therapists, because they want to make sure that they're keeping such a rapid pace during instruction, that they actually place out their hand and uh, closer to that correct stimulus because they're trying to wrap up each trial uh, quickly, but um, they're actually unaware that they're prompting the student to um, give them the correct stimulus. So to do this, uh, just take some, do some video recording. It's good anyways, just to, just for um, fidelity of implementation. And it's a nice way to give some clear objective and constructive feedback as a supervisor. Um, some other things to do during, um, from the outset of instruction is to ensure that you're delivering the instruction after securing eye contact, if that's um, possible. Um, it just really increases the likelihood that uh, if the learner did error, it's um, truly because it was an incorrect response rather than they were not um, attending to the instruction. Um, also refrain from delivering pre-attending cues, um, such as hands down or repeating the learner's name if that's possible. Um, that's just a good way to establish good instructional control. And also, um, when you need to arrange or rearrange your materials, um, do so out of the learner's view. Um, I've seen before um, some therapists during a remedial trial, they just move the items um, within an array in front of the student rather than taking all the visual stimuli out, shuffling it under the table, and then representing it. Um, that's because some of the learners might actually just um, focus on what they were just prompted to select, and then they'll just watch you move those items around. And so again, they're not really attending to the relevant characteristics of the um, of the SD, but rather some irrelevant aspect. So again, that's faulty stimulus control there. Okay, so I'm just going to go over some um, different kinds of prompts that can be used. Um, if you do know that your learner has um, a history of faulty stimulus control, I would recommend avoiding um, stimulus prompts. Uh, these are the prompts that involve materials. We have um, your positional redundancy or movement. Um, but, so a positional prompt is when you move the SE in closer proximity to the learner. Um, a redundancy prompt is exaggerating the SE in, in some way. So it could be the color or the size or shape of the SE. And then a movement prompt could involve the therapist either tapping or shaking the item. Um, I, I would recommend avoiding these prompts because, again, it's not drawing the learner's attention to those relevant aspects of the SD. And again, it can actually um, enhance faulty stimulus control. Um, if you are using some response prompts, uh, these are the prompts um, that involve a therapist. Um, I would recommend um, having a plan to um, fade them out quickly, as it's good practice to only be using prompts temporarily. Okay, so 
Next, we're going to talk about some of the different antecedent strategies that can be used to um, address faulty stimulus control. We have um, observing response and differential observing responses that can be used. And then later, we'll talk about all the variations of different error correction strategies that can be used in combination with these antecedent approaches. Okay, so an observing response uh, increases the learner's sensory contact with a sample stimulus. Um, it could be having the therapist say, listen or look at me to ensure that they're attending. Um, you could also cover your comparison stimuli um, and then require the learner to flip over each uh, sheet of paper. Um, just this will increase the likelihood that the learner will be attending to the visual stimuli. Also, you could have a learner touch a card prior to instruction. Um, if it's some kind of computer task, you can also place um, a response requirement of having the learner uh, click the screen a certain number of times. Uh, Dottie and Hawkins was a, uh, in 2011 were able to uh, reduce um, stimulus over selectivity by requiring the participants to um, click the screen 10 times instead of once in a two sample delayed match to sample task. So this just ensured that the learner was attending to the screen. So in the observing response, each response is going to be the same across multiple trials. Whereas once you move into um, a differential observing response, um, this is where you have a unique response associated to the sample stimulus. So across every trial, um, the differential observing response will be different. Um, a DOR, um, a differential observing response, increases the likelihood that the learner will attend uh, to the critical features of the sample stimulus in the presence of multiple um, comparison stimuli. So there's two types. You can either use a visual uh, differential observing response or an auditory differential observing response. Um, you can use a visual DOR um, during sight word instruction. So again, thinking about if a learner is only attending to one part of the word um, or either the first letter or the maybe the middle letter or third letter of the word and you want them to attend to all three, what you can do is um, warm up with a DOR trial where they have to match um, that particular letter. So in this case, they're matching the third letter of the word. And then the therapist would present the comparison stimuli for the original trial and then say the, say the instruction, cat. And then the learner selects the word cat. So this draws the learner's attention to attending to the third letter of that word. Okay. You can also use a visual differential observing response for a receptive identification by name program. Um, so you would pick out that relevant characteristics that's associated with that um, with the SD. So in this case, it would be a zebra, which has stripes. So you would have, um, you can use matching as a DOR. So having a learner match stripes with stripes first um, before um, going into the original trial, which is um, presenting the comparison stimuli saying zebra, and then the learner attends to the stripes. And then they would most likely select stripes. You can also use an auditory DOR. So in 2011, um, growing colleagues noticed a Wednesday error pattern for one of their participants. Um, so they introduced an auditory DOR where the learner had to um, repeat um, after the therapist. So the therapist would say crane, and then the learner says crane, um, following that the original trial was presented. So the, compares, the comparison stimuli is presented and then the auditory instruction crane is presented. Um, this just allows for more than one observation um, for the learner to attend to that auditory sample stimulus. Some other terms that have been used in the literature for this have been echolalia or um, a repeated auditory stimulus and naming. Um, another thing you can consider is if your learner doesn't have any vocal ability, you can consider using a modified sign or using sign language. So um, having the learner just repeat the sign associated with the auditory sample stimulus. Okay, so up until this point, everything here has been more on the antecedent side. So now I'm going to switch gears and talk about um, all the different possible consequence strategies that you can use in combination with these antecedent um, strategies.
Okay, so um, as you may already know, um, error correction is a consequence based strategy that's often used to address persistent errors um, and faulty stimulus control. But the process of selecting one can be a daunting task for any practitioner as um, there's such wide variability across clinical settings um, to, in both teaching procedures and techniques to reduce errors or correct errors. So on this slide here, here are just a few examples of the different comparison studies that have been found in the literature. Um, however, to date, the results of these comparison studies um, on different error correction procedures have been mixed. There are a couple exceptions, which I'll go through over the next few slides. One exception is a study by Barbetta, Huron, and Hayward in 1993. Um, they were looking at sight word instruction, and they compared two different conditions, one which, worked, one which required the learner to engage in um, an active learner response contingent on an incorrect response. Um, and the other condition just involved, uh, the no response condition, involved just passive uh, learning. So uh, the learner did not have to um, repeat after the, the therapist. What they found was uh, for all six participants, um, they all responded better with the active learning response. Okay. In the next study here, done by Rogers and Iwata in 1991, um, they actually, the authors actually identified some possible behavioral mechanisms that were um, related to the efficacy of these error correction procedures. So they noted four general strategies um, that followed contingent upon incorrect responding that can be attributed to that behavior change. So extinction, which is no feedback, or the therapist would uh, just proceed to the next trial. Um, there can be extinction with a brief delay. So this, the brief delay serves as a time out before moving on to the next trial. Um, you might have a remedial trial. Um, so the learner has another opportunity to respond. And then you might have a component of punishment, um, such as response costs or removing um, a stimulus from the instructional environment, or presenting an additional task. Uh, such a, it can be a relevant task or it can be an irrelevant task. Um, this is also known as positive practice. So as these consequences might as these consequences might be slightly aversive, the learner would then be negatively reinforced um, by responding correctly. So that would result in the removal of that additional trial. Okay. So Rogers and Iwata compared uh, three different conditions in their study. Um, and they had a match to sample task in their study. So during baseline, they kept differential reinforcement in place just to def uh, demonstrate the effect of positive reinforcement alone for correct responses. They had a practice condition uh, which involved both positive and negative reinforcement and enhanced stimulus control. Um, so the repeated trials would establish, um, would establish stimulus control. And then in the avoidance condition, um, repeated trials of an unrelated task. So again, here their um, results were mixed for all seven participants. Um, but what's great about this study is that it helps, it may be helpful for practitioners to identify which behavioral mechanism is related to that error correction procedure that they're using. Okay, here's our next comparison study uh, completed by Smith and colleagues. The, their study was designed to test the effects of saying no versus modeling as an error correction procedure. Um, the task they had were was matching words to corresponding pictures. Um, again, here the results were um, inconsistent or mixed across the participants. Um, however, one thing that they noted was um, for one of the participants, um, there was actually slower acquisition um, associated with the error statement um, condition. So perhaps the participant found receiving no um, as corrective feedback uh, may have been um, slightly aversive. So what's important about this study, it really draws your attention to um, having to individualize error correction procedures across learners based on um, you know, the types of errors that are happening and also aspects of the tasks and um, their learning history. So 
um, again, if they find uh, corrective feedback as aversive, you might consider switching to a different error correction strategy. Okay. Um, another comparison study was completed by Leaf and colleagues. They looked at two choice discriminations that were that was taught in pairs. They looked at no-no prompting, um, which requires the learner to engage in two consecutive errors before the experimenter presenting a controlling prompt. Um, so the controlling prompt is there to ensure the learner would respond correctly. Uh, compared to simultaneous prompting, um, which allows for the prompt immediately. So they noted two differences across these two different uh, error correction procedures. Uh, the rate of prompting, so um, in simultaneous prompting, they're getting prompted on every single trial. Um, and also the rate of the reinforcement, again in simultaneous prompting, um, there's a reinforcement associated with each trial. Okay. However, they noted that for all three participants here, the no-no prompting was more efficient. Okay. So here's another comparison study by Turan and colleagues. They had a receptive labeling task and they compared two different conditions, um, a delay condition um, which is a five second delay following an error and then repeating that original trial with a prompt uh, versus the independent probe condition. Um, so they had a three second delay following an error and then they also represented the trial with a prompt, um, but they actually added in a distractor trial. So this was a, a unrelated task before presenting the original trial once more without the prompt. Um, however, again here, the results were mixed. Okay, so another comparison study by uh, Megan and Lerman here. Um, their purpose was a little bit different. Um, they wanted to identify the least intrusive but most efficient procedure for teaching simple and conditional discriminations. They, their task here was sightword instructions. Okay. Um, so what they did was they ranked the level of intrusiveness by uh, the amount of additional responding that was required uh, from the learner and the therapist. So an error statement, um, which is receiving vocal feedback, was considered the least intrusive. And um, on the most intrusive end, we have direct rehearsal, where the learner had to uh, engage in three consecutive remedial trials unprompted. Interestingly, uh, in contrast to the study by Barbetta and colleagues, they found that for four of their five participants, the initial assessments actually show that modeling alone was an effective error correction procedure. So this is in contrast to Barbetta's because uh, Barbetta study because they noted active um, student response was more effective. However, the author the authors did note that um, this may be due to a difference in the measurement of their dependent um, variables. Uh, one study looked at the number of trials to mastery whereas the other study looked at the percentage of words correctly read. Okay, and here we have Leaf and colleagues again in 2014. Um, so the past few slides have looked at comparison studies. However, um, response prompting is also a method for transferring stimulus control from the prompt to the SD, and it can be done nearly errorlessly. So Leaf and colleagues noted that it was unknown whether a near errorless prompting system, such as most to least prompting, would be more effective than an error correction procedure. So they had two different participants, um, and you can see here listed on the screen is the most to least prompting hierarchy used for each of those participants um, compared to that error correction procedure. Um, for both participants, they noted that most to least and error correction procedure was effective. So in summary, there are so many different types of error correction procedures that one can choose from, um, but what's been emphasized in the literature is that it's really important to select one based on one's um, error patterns or um, the aspects of the task and the learner's history with that task. Um, and also another thing to consider is uh, whether or not to use an observing response or differential observing response from the outside of instruction. So often 
uh, these are included more as a rescue procedure, so only after faulty someone's control has been established. So it would be um, interesting to note in future studies if they looked at using a observing response or differential observing response from the outset would actually be more effective than using it as a rescue procedure. Also, it's important to conduct an error analysis. So really think about taking your data to see what kind of error pattern is, is happening and then troubleshooting from uh, that point. Uh, you can also look back at your assessments. Think about the different prerequisite skills that might need to be, um, that might need a booster session on, or um, if possible, if there are multiple error correction procedures that are efficient, maybe think about using the one that's least intrusive. Um, Another thing that Leaf and colleagues did in 2010, they assessed for um, the participants' preference for the different prompting procedures. Um, so uh, that could be another thing that can be considered for the participants. And then lastly, um, just plan ahead. I think that's the take-home point that I would like everyone to take away. Um, in the words of Benjamin Franklin, when you fail to plan, you're planning to fail. Okay, so um, here I have my references. Um, and then I also wanted to just send out a quick thank you to um, Pat Miranda, Dr. Pat Miranda, who was my um, thesis research supervisor, uh, Dr. Laura Groh, who was an external examiner for my thesis committee, um, Dr. Joanna Cannon, who was on my thesis committee, as well as Dr. Um, Andrea Kusunik, who is the current head of school. Okay. Uh, here is my contact information in case you have any uh, 